My name is Justin, and I'm an addict, and thanks to my God, the steps, and the fellowship of other addicts, I'm sober one day at a time since June 19th, 2015, and for that, I am beyond grateful. Welcome to the RICO 12 speaker meeting. We are an organization whose addictions include alcohol, drugs, food, uh, gambling, lust, and sex, just to name a few. We come together from all places, faiths, and backgrounds to lear learn the similarities of addiction and to gain tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. We invite recovering addicts with at least one year sobriety and who are actively working their recovery in their respective fellowships to share their experience, strength, and hope on a live Zoom meeting each Friday at noon central time for 20 to 25 minutes. Then we, the live audience, get the opportunity to ask questions of that speaker for another 20 to 25 minutes. In order to ask questions, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. If you are hearing this podcast recorded and would like to participate as a live audience member, or if you'd like to be a guest speaker in a future meeting, please go to rico12.com, that's R-E-C-O-1-2 dot com, to learn more and submit your email address there to receive weekly invitations or to submit to become a guest speaker. RICO 12 is a self-supporting service, and we appreciate your help in keeping it that way. We gratefully accept contributions to help cover the costs of the Zoom platform, podcast platform, web hosting, and administrative costs. To contribute, you can go to rico12.com forward slash support, or you can click the link to PayPal that is in the chat of the live meeting, live meeting or in the show notes of the podcast. When you contribute, please specify the meeting number. This helps us track some things. This is meeting number 36. Uh, last week's meeting was with Ruri O oh from Northern Ireland, and he spoke on the topic of surrender, a therapeutic practice. If you missed hearing that one, it was a very good meeting. A hint, I had to listen to it a second time for my ear to tune into his accent and more fully understand his very solid message. But once my ear was tuned in, I really was quite enlightened. We have 35 previous speaker meetings of this podcast, and I have gained and learned something from each meeting. If you haven't heard them yet, you can listen to them in podcast form by searching for RICO 12 Speaker Meeting Podcast on virtually any podcast platform that you use, or you can go to the RICO 12 website and find it under the link podcast. If you find this, uh, if you find this service val of value to you, please take a moment to go to the podcast platform of your choosing and leave a rating and review. It helps us work our 12th step by carrying the message of recovery to more addicts who suffer. And I'm going to take one more second here and just kind of uh, be grateful for some, some growth that is happening with RICO 12. Um, this week, we reached a, a little um, milestone. Our 8,000th download happened this week. And in about six and a half months, I think that's pretty good considering we started out the first month with less than 150 downloads. What a really cool thing. And what's really cool about it is that 28% uh, of downloads are outside of the United States. Uh, so in 53 countries, we're, we're, uh, we have been able to share this message of experience, strength, and hope to the addict who suffers. And I'd like to help. I, I, I am appreciative for your help in, in getting that message out there. All right. One more word about our speakers before we introduce today's speaker, Thomas. When we line up a speaker for a meeting, we ask them to seek guidance on what and how to present so that they can reflect the light they have been given. That light will inspire hope, meaning, worth, and growth in each of us, the listening audience. Now let's introduce him for today, Thomas, whose talk is entitled Game Changers of Recovery. Here's a little bit about Thomas. Um, Thomas has been married for 20 years is a father of two amazing children and a grateful son of God whose life has taken a 180 degree turn since entering recovery from a 30 year sex addiction in March of 2016. Since entering into recovery, his life, marriage, hobbies, and service activities and career have all changed as God molds him into the man God wants him to be. He and his wife created the website, destroytheplague.com, providing resources dedicated to destroying the plague of pornography. Thomas is a member of two recovery fellowships. He facilitates a recovery meeting of the Addiction Recovery Program of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and is also a member of SAL. Today, Thomas will share with us the game changers of his recovery. Thomas, the floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you, Justin. I feel honored to speak with you and this audience. My name is Thomas, and I am a lustaholic, sober since March 21st, 2016. 
For months, I've been listening to RICO 12, and I've enjoyed the content here so much. Specifically, I've benefited from episode 12 with Kevin H. on emotional sobriety, episode 15 with Blake M. on reconciling childhood trauma, and episode 21 with Damon W. on controlling the controllables. I don't think I'm ever going to forget uh, to be a coffee bean from his talk. So much great content here. Thank you. As regular listeners will know, and as you just heard, Justin encourages his speakers to seek guidance from their higher power regarding what they share. I've taken that guidance to heart, and I hope my time with you today will be valuable for you in some way. I will share my addiction recovery story for context, but I am also excited to share with you what I call the game changers of my recovery. I was born to wonderful parents, great parents who taught me and encouraged me to make right choices. One of the things they taught me was that pornography was bad and dangerous. At eight years old, I was involved in stage productions where there was pornography hidden around backstage. I was curious and I made it kind of a game to go and seek out these images. The next four years, I was in two more productions where the atmosphere was similar I continued to seek out and find pornography, and I was immersed in a highly sexualized atmosphere where sex was talked about and sometimes experimented with. This laid the foundation of a 30-year struggle with lust, pornography, objectification of women, and sexually acting out in a variety of ways that lasted from 8 to 38 years old. My teenage years became a testing ground for me to hone my skills living a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde life. By day, the Honorable Thomas was a decent son, brother, church-going, service-oriented Boy Scout. But I had a dark side, a manipulative, secretive, self-serving, pleasure-seeking hypocrite who would use others for his own purposes. At age 19, I minimized things in my head significantly and did what I thought I needed to do in order to be worthy to serve a two-year mission for my church in the Philippines. And serve I did. However, a month before my mission ended, I acted out in an illegal way that should have resulted in my being sent home dishonorably. I minimized events to my mission leader, and he didn't want to send me home with only three and a half weeks left on my mission. He counseled me to seek professional help when I returned home, but I didn't. I returned home honorably, air quotes there, and swept it under the rug. And I soon fell back into old behaviors. While I was single, I would really try to change my behaviors. Other times I would give up trying and bask in the life of self-abuse and using others. I would go three months or even six months without viewing pornography, but the lust was pervasive and acting out was routine. If I even went 30 days, I would congratulate myself and tell myself that I was probably cured. I committed to myself over and over again that it would never happen again. I would occasionally seek help from church leaders, but between my minimizing and their lack of knowledge on how to handle one with an addiction as pervasive as mine, nothing ever changed. Meeting the woman who would eventually be my wife was another time of relative sobriety as I looked forward to marriage with her. Unfortunately, I acted out one week before our marriage. In my faith, we have a special place for people to get married, but it requires a certain level of worthiness to be married there. I did not meet those worthiness requirements, but I went through with the marriage anyway in a state of denial, fear, and rebellion. In stereotypical fashion, I told myself that marriage would solve my problem. Marriage did not solve the problem, and within a few months of marriage, I was back to viewing pornography. The Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde life intensified. As the white book says, my insides never matched what I saw on the outsides of others. And this led to even more acting out behaviors whenever I could safely get away with it. 
As my career progressed, so did the business trips and the opportunities for acting out increased. All of this obviously drove disconnection with my wife and with my higher power. My wife did not catch me. She didn't know what I was doing, but she could feel something was off. Deep down, she could feel it. She did sometimes observe me flirting with or seeking attention from other women. I also was very full of bravado and needed to be the center of attention. I didn't feel like I had that big of a problem. In the thick of it, I would have never even called my problem an addiction. However, I was having affairs in my head daily, and I was also having real emotional affairs with women in the neighborhood, at work, and at church. These behaviors had the effect of a 16-year slow car accident, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually for my wife, for me, and our marriage. This pattern of behavior also led me to a pervasive habit of lying and being dishonest, and not just about my sexual issues, but about other things, even small things like conversations I'd had with people or things I'd bought at the grocery store. I didn't even tell my best friend I had these problems when he opened up and trusted me with similar problems. After 16 years of marriage, of hiding, of lying, denying any wrongdoing, gaslighting, and making it seem to everybody else like I was the perfect one with no problems, she was devastated. She could feel that I was not connected to her since the beginning of our marriage. One evening, we were in between homes and we were staying in a temporary apartment. She broke. She told me she had decided to take the kids and move to her parents. My wife was not going to stay in the marriage and we were headed for divorce. As she told me these things, I felt a strong prompting saying, tell her the truth now or you will lose her. So I started confessing. I went back to the beginning when I was eight years old and I told her I thought I might have a pornography problem. I told her many things she did not know about me. She was very angry. I felt devastated. I went to my church leader to get help. He was a man who had recovery of his own and he was tremendously helpful. I am so grateful for him. He guided us to the 12-step program offered by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Each step for me was like a lightning bolt. My heart began to change. I didn't just learn how to stop viewing pornography. I learned how to stop lying, how to stop blaming my wife, how to stop seeking attention from other women, and how to be aware of my underlying triggers and emotions. I also learned how to gain a progressive victory over lust to the point where I can look people in the eyes and say, I do not lust. I'm going to explain more about that in a moment. As I attended 12-step meetings, my issue changed from, I have a little problem, to, I have a real big addiction. From, I'm not hurting anyone, to, I now see how I'm hurting myself and others, especially my wife. I used to think, I'm going to take this to the grave. And now, I let truth prevail. I let the truth come out. In my original ARP group, there were nine other men who were all like me, weighed down with the constant battle of lust and the burdens of pornography and other sexual issues. Now I know that there are hundreds of classes each week, both virtual and in person, with thousands of men attending these classes. I am blessed to live in a place where there are dozens of 12-step meetings each week, with thousands of men just in my area getting help. Currently, I facilitate an ARP group, and I also participate in a weekly SA Lifeline group. My life has gone from one of isolation to connection. I'm connected with my wife, with other brothers, and with my higher power. 
I am so grateful for the recovery God has blessed me with. So with that as background, I'd like to move into the game changers of my recovery. These are six things that helped me find true recovery from my sexual addiction. Game changer number one, committing to the 12 steps. Game changer number two, the step four process. Game changer number three, abandoning media. Game changer number four, mindfulness. Game changer number five, separating temptation from lust. And game changer number six, sponsor, sponsoring, and a support network. Game changer number one, committing to the 12-step program. Disclosure day to my wife initially brought many changes, including a visit to my church leader who committed me to attending the 12-step program. Here, I felt connection. This is exactly where I'm supposed to be, hit me on the second meeting. I started attending in 2016, and I'm still close friends with several men from that group that I attended for my first two years in recovery. I continue to attend 12-step meetings because of the strength I feel there, a spirit of humility, honesty, and shared experience. You hear men in the military talk of the brotherhood they experience in the intensity of war. I feel a similar connection with my brothers in 12-step because we are feeling the intensity of this battle, the battle for our wives, families, freedom from addiction, and ourselves. And here I'll say, if you haven't listened to episode 28, Justin B's I Am Already Dead, you've got to listen to that one. Game changer number two, the step four process. This process took me three years. All of the steps are difficult in their own way, but perhaps step four was the most challenging for me. I believe writing a personal moral inventory is one of the most difficult things I have ever done in my life. My process of writing this inventory included writing over 100 pages in two different attempts over the course of two years. A year later, when it was sadly evident that I was still hiding things, I completed a 16-page black and white yes or no disclosure, which was confirmed by polygraph. However, now that everything is out, and my step four is complete, I feel peace and gratitude that I have no more secrets. Game changer number three, abandoning media. For me, this includes television, movies, social media, newspapers, magazines, and unapproved fiction literature. This was a game changer in my recovery for two reasons. First, it greatly reduced the frequency and intensity of triggers that I was willingly consuming. Second, it freed up tons of time for me to focus on recovery efforts, especially service to my wife, family, and doing step 12 and giving service to other addicts. Giving up media forced me to ask myself, where is recovery in my list of priorities? Is it more important to me than video games? Yes. Is it more important to me than watching athletic contests? Yes, it is. Recovery and staying present and out of fantasy and escapism is way more important to me than a bouncing ball, elves and dwarves, and even lightsaber-wielding fantasy heroes. I know I just struck a chord with some of you out there. My recovery is more important than all of that combined. Game changer number four is mindfulness. Tom B. on episode 29 of RICO 12 gave an excellent share on meditation. He's a true expert. Overcoming misconceptions of meditation and mindfulness were key to me in finding success in this area. Mindfulness is not just for tree huggers and hippies. It's not about sitting in a lotus position. Mindfulness and meditation is simple. It's too simple, too easy, and too basic. That's what throws people off. But that's also what's so wonderful about it. Meditation and mindfulness has helped me slow down. 
By slowing down, I am more aware of my emotions and triggers. For the first few years, I used Headspace to meditate. And honestly, it was very helpful for me to learn the basics of meditation, breathing, visualization, and especially the technique of noting. Now I seek out God-focused meditations, and I produce Christian meditations that are specific to the male lust addict. Thanks to guidance from Father Bill W. that I learned back in August on episode 8 of this RICO 12 podcast, I've also been practicing two-way prayer with some very surprising results. The bottom line is that I need to keep my recovery real. I need to keep it fresh. Mindfulness is one way of keeping it exciting. I also enjoy meditating with sound environments such as the free atmospheres found on mynoise.net. Game changer number five, separating temptation from lust. After learning the technique of noting and after meditating for some time, I was learning to be much more aware of my emotions and honest with myself about them. Our minds are a constantly swirling ocean of emotions. And in recovery, I would go throughout my day and I would feel triggers. I'd get so frustrated by those triggers, these temptations. But then I realized something very important. As a Christian, I follow Jesus Christ. His example to me is a perfect one. But Christ felt temptation. Yet he was still perfect. Therefore, I too can feel temptations. And that does not define a failure on my part. What I needed to do was to practice separating temptation from the act of lust in my head. This took some practice because I'd been doing that my entire life. There was no separation between the two. But after the concept is grasped, it became easier for me to understand. And it also meant that I could exercise greater self-compassion by not beating myself up every time I felt a temptation. Rather, now, when I feel a temptation, I note it, I become aware of it, and I create a gap between the temptation and the thought of lust. I surrender it, and then I move on with my day without falling. This is my progressive victory over lust, as the White Book describes it. Game changer number six, sponsor, sponsoring, and a support network. Do you remember as a child when your guardian may have told you, hey, I don't want you hanging around those kids. They're not a good influence on you. In the same way, I need to surround myself with people who are supportive of my recovery efforts. This has been crucial to me in my recovery. I started building my support network by first including my wife. She is my best friend. I wanted her to know me, the real me. And she also had the desire for 100% honesty. She needed to be able to trust me where she couldn't stay in the marriage. Next, I included my church leader in my support network. After that, I included brothers from my 12-step group. I also included my best friend that had confided in me. I included my mother, my siblings, my in-laws, and eventually a few men at work, little by little. I also got a sponsor who was an addict in recovery and expert at the 12 steps. He has been very helpful to me in many important ways, guiding me through the steps, even helping me find a new career and just being a great friend. Being a support person and a sponsor has come with its own set of challenges. I have been privileged to support dozens of amazing, wonderful men. On a couple of occasions, I have made mistakes in this area, and I do feel some remorse for friendships lost and support efforts that were halted. I continue to learn and grow. Sponsoring helps me identify even more character weaknesses and try to improve, and it helps me keep my recovery strong. In closing, I share this. I've never been more connected with my wife. I love her with my whole heart instead of a piece of my heart. 
Honesty with my wife was the beginning of my recovery. My wife has needed her own recovery from her trail, her trauma of betrayal. Our relationship needed recovery. I have never felt more connected with my higher power. God, my father, loves me. And I feel that love. And I feel grateful for it every day. It's been a long road, one that we are still on. In the words of Andrew Papain, the author of Sitting in a Rowboat, Throwing Marbles at a Battleship, recovery is possible and it is wonderful. I am evidence of that. I am still active in my recovery. I am not an expert. I am just someone in the trenches trying to help others in the trenches. My efforts to help others come from a pure intention to genuinely help people find more peace and happiness in their lives and overcome addiction. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you so much, Thomas. That was awesome. Um, I love the, uh, I love these six game changers that you delineated, and I'm sure we're going to touch on a few of them as we get into the Q&A. I've got some questions on a couple, and I'm sure that several here in the in the live audience also have some questions for you. Um, before we read those questions that have come in, it, yeah, Thomas, I'd like you to take about 60 seconds and just talk about an additional way or maybe some additional uh, angles on how being part of the fellowships that you're part of really helps you. Fellowships are very helpful for me um, because of the the honesty and the camaraderie there. And I love helping other men too. And it's just this really positive cycle of giving help and being helped. And so that's why I attend those two meetings each week. Awesome. And I and I think it's really neat and I think it's vital really in these uh, fellowships to have people who have long-term sobriety to keep coming back. They provide the hope and the, uh, the, the, the light for those people coming in to see that, Hey, this truly is possible. All right. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. Um, Now it's time for our guest speaker to answer your questions. I've received a few and we'll get to as many as we can address in the next 20 or so minutes. Um, our first question comes in from uh, one of our live um, audience members. He says, Thomas, how did you manage to abandon all media? And that was kind of a question that I had too. So let me, the, so, so that, that um, game changer, number three, abandon all media could seem extreme to some people. Uh, for some people, it may not be absolutely necessary, but for others it is. Um, I, I, I liken it to much to the rich young ruler that comes to Jesus and says, Hey, what do I need to do? And Jesus says, I need you to do this. You know, for some people, it may be sell all you have. It may be give up all media for other people. It may be something else, but for you, it's give up all media. So how did you go about doing that? I didn't go about, um, abandoning media all at once. It kind of snuck up on me. Like at first I just got rid of television and then after, you know, watching a movie or two, I thought, this isn't good for me. Like, even if someone was on the screen that was dressed appropriately, it could still be triggering for me. So I became more aware of those triggers. And then, you know, movies went. And then um, I was in a waiting room at a dental office. And I was just thumbing through a magazine that was on the desk. And there was something in there that was triggering me. So I just thought, I'm going to play it safe and just get rid of that too. And so it kind of snowballed. It wasn't like I went cold turkey on everything all at once, but someone's got to be on the extreme end of the spectrum. And I'm happy to hold the flag there. I like the way you closed that. Happy to hold the flag on the extreme end of the, of the spectrum. Awesome. All right. We have a question from another anonymous attendee. He asks that you describe a little bit about your experience with two-way prayer. And by the way, two-way prayer is my daily bread. It's my manna in the wilderness. And I'm, I'm pumped that you're practicing it. So yeah, let's, let's hear what your experience is with that. Well, like I said, Justin, thank you for having father Bill W come on because uh, I'd never really thought about two-way prayer until that episode. And 
the, I say the results were surprising because it was very powerful for me. And some of the experiences I've had with two-way prayer, just even in the last few months, are sacred. Um, but I love the, the practice of writing down um, what I'm feeling, that God is speaking to me. And it has become much more real to me. Uh, the outpourings of his love and his attention for me in my life with the specifics since I started practicing two-way prayer. Thank you. I appreciate your experience there. All right. Another question from an anonymous attendee. During your recovery process, did you ever doubt if the steps would work or if you would find would ever find recovery? If so, how did you reconcile the doubts? Yes. I, I doubted myself. I doubted whether um, this was going to work for me for sure. But I started having some pretty big spiritual experiences right out of the gate when I started doing the 12 step program. And um, based on those experiences, I was just like, this is working. I could see progress. And as I started, you know, step four, which I said took me a long, long time, really. But there was a time early on where I thought, oh, wrote it all up. I'm done with step four. Even then, I felt progress being made. And then step five, confession. Step six, a change of heart. Like I said, each step was like a lightning bolt for me. And it just became evident that this, this was working. And with each step that I would complete, I, I started having more and more faith in the process. Thank you. All right. Uh, another question from our audience. How can I practice meditation? I feel like I am in my mind all the time and disconnected and judging my thoughts and behavior all the time. So I, I also struggle with a busy mind. And, and meditation is sometimes difficult for me, but uh, explain how you practice that. Yeah. Um, meditation practitioners call that monkey mind where your mind is, you know, jumping from one thing to the next super fast. And the practice of meditation is to just be aware of that initially and to just acknowledge it and say, yeah, that's happening and, and how it worked for me was I had some exercises that I would do that helped me to just keep it super simple. Even counting to 10 or counting my breaths in, out, in, out, and just kind of focusing on super basic things, listening to my heartbeat and, and trying, and it's not so much of like forcing yourself to get rid of other thoughts, but it's just being aware of those other thoughts as they I heard it, you know, once kind of the analogy was, are you standing in the middle of the road with the cars flying by, you know, you left and right? Or are you out of the road on the side of the road, watching the cars drive by? And that's, that's kind of the difference. And yeah, I kind of mentioned that in my share, like, it's possible to be trying too hard. This is super simple. And just sitting with yourself and your emotions is what meditation is all about. Awesome. And I have a follow-up question on that that I think relates to your fifth game changer, separating temptation from lust. Um, you know, in my own life, in my own experience, and also talking to many um, fellow lust addicts, one of the biggest self loathing things that people come to me with initially is oh, I'm feeling so triggered. This happened and I saw this or I thought this or whatever. And, and just from that trigger, they, and I have felt this way, feel that, Oh, well, <laughs> I basically just relapsed because of that trigger, even though I didn't carry <laughs> out anything with it. How do you separate that? I mean, you did a really good job of explaining it, but Tie it to the meditation practice also. How do you identify it, give it a name, and move on without drinking it in? You have asked the, the exact question I asked myself for the first few years in recovery, and it's because for me there was no separation. If I felt a trigger, boom, I was lusting. Those two were completely one and the same. 
on Destroy the Plague, I have free meditations that I've put out there called Separating Temptation from Lust Collection. And it offers some ways for people to practice that. But really what it is, is to note it and then to be curious about it. Ah, I'm feeling a temptation. Once you've noted it and you feel curious about it, then you become aware of it. Okay, now I'm feeling a temptation. I have a choice. What am I going to do about it? And all of these things are creating a gap between the initial trigger and what used to happen, which was immediately going into a lustful thought. So by practicing that, noting, being curious about it in a healthy way, being aware of it, acknowledging that there's a, there's, there's a gap, and then surrendering it. Those are the basic steps. That's how I've, I've separated temptation from the act of lust. And it does take a little bit of practice, but it is totally possible. Awesome. I appreciate that. I will be checking out those, that series of uh, meditations there on the website, destroytheplague.com. And I'll make sure that that link is put in the show notes of, um, of this episode here of this meeting. Um, another question has come in. And before I read that, a reminder, if you in the audience have any questions for Thomas, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, and we'll get to those. All right. Question that came in from one of our live audience. What advice do you, what advice do you have on you balancing your wife's boundaries and your own? That is a really great question. I'm not sure I have any advice on that, but I can tell you that it has um, been a, a journey of give and take. The damage that I have done to my wife over the last 16 years is real. And there, the, there's been this kind of the, the scale has tipped. And I'm okay with that. Um, there are boundaries that she needs. There are boundaries that I need. One thing that has been very essential for me is to own my boundaries and to really believe them and understand why I need them in my heart. So I would say that I give her a lot of space. I give her a lot of leeway in, in telling me what she needs me to do in order for her, her to feel safe. And then I try my best to do everything I can to help her feel safe. Because I damaged her for so long, and now it's my turn to try to make that up. I don't know if that's helpful and I definitely don't want that to be hard and fast advice for others, but it's what's worked for me. No, I appreciate that. And that is a concern I have in some places too. Yes. I, as an addict have, well, basically steamrolled my wife and those that I love for many years um, in boundaries that get set up on the other side, oftentimes I either submit myself to being steamrolled and giving into everything that because I deserve this. But to me, that sounds like a revenge type thing rather than a forgiveness thing. So I have a hard time with that myself. What um, I want to stay here for just a minute and kind of just get your thoughts again. It's not, once again, this is not professional advice here. This is experience of, you know, our own experience, but how would one who is now, you know, who has steamrolled in the past and is now getting steamrolled, how would one stand up again and not steamroll back, but set their own boundaries in those respects? What are your thoughts on that, Thomas? First, I, I think the word steamrolled is a little strong for the, not for what I had done to my wife, but for what my wife um, uh, could be perhaps from an outsider point of view doing to the addict and, or for me in my situation. For me, it comes down to step seven. I had my way for so long. I, I crossed so many lines and also in my relationship with her out of pride. And now it is a time for me to exercise step seven, humility, and to just be there for her, to change what I need to change in my life to help her feel safe. And I feel 
I feel honored to do that. I feel blessed to be able to, to serve her in this way after everything I've put her through. I, I really appreciate that perspective. Um, thank you for sharing that. Got a question, another one from our live audience. And this one's really um, um, straight and pointed, I guess. How can I love myself? And that's basically the whole question. How can I love myself? Now, there's nothing surrounding that, but I'm assuming um, this person is, you know, maybe in a similar spot where we have found ourselves. You know, you found yourself several years back of, man, I'm just a giant mess. And the, the, the wake of my destruction behind me is, is ridiculous. How can I love myself through that? What are your thoughts on that, Thomas? What a wonderful question. And that's a deep question. And I sense there's, there's a lot of emotion behind that question. There have definitely been times in my recovery where I have um, felt depressed or even had suicidal thoughts. What helped me get out of that was to remember who I am and to remember what I have to offer to others. I remember one time where I didn't feel like going on. And I thought I just went there for a minute. I just let myself go there. And I said, what would happen if I carried this out and took myself out of this world? Immediately, I thought about the look on my wife's face when she were to find out. I thought about what it would do to my children, to my younger siblings, to my brothers in recovery. And I just thought, I can't, I can't do that. And then, so to answer the question, perhaps just think about all the things that you do that are good and that are, and have that, and have gratitude for all that you have and, and the blessing that you are to other people. I, I know that's a really hard area to give advice in, but uh, realize who you are as a son of God and your, your value now and your potential. I don't know what else to say on that one. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. This one's a comment uh, coming in from one of our live audience members. He says, my wife and I are also thinning down our media. It's good to know I'm not alone with this because some days it feels really overwhelming or frustrating and always feels like I'm the only one in the world that cares aside from my wife about the media entering our home. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts or comments about that, Thomas? I am at war with media. I am looking for more soldiers and recruits. So if there's anybody out there that wants to give up media, um, please join me in my crusade. <laughs> You're not alone. Awesome. I love that. All right. Another question. And this has to do with uh, separating temptation from lust again. I think it's good to follow up on this because this is, it's a hard one. Um, this, uh, this, participant in the audience says, I am a lustaholic. If I see a good looking woman and take a second look, but don't lust after her, how do I separate the temptation from the lust? What's your experience with that, Thomas? Super, super typical experience, right? 50% uh, of the population of this world is going to be female and there's no way to avoid uh, certain temptations, whether it's on the street or in the grocery store or driving the car or whatever. So those, those situations are going to come up. For me, um, part of being aware is kind of like uh, having a contraption on the top of my head that's kind of like the Google self-driving cars, you know, the, the gyroscope and the, the video cameras constantly going around me. And so this is kind of like Mad-Eye Moody, the, the constant vigilance. You know, when I'm out in public, I have that camera going on and I'm kind of always just being a little aware of my surroundings. And sometimes I can sense a, a person that would be a triggering person for me in the periphery. And I'm able to just, again, note it and kind of change what I'm doing to, to stay out of the path of, of having those temptations. Um, it isn't easy when by chance, you know, something does 
come in front of your eyes and it's just inevitable, then that's when I, I go into my sequence of noting it, being curious, curious about it. Ah, I'm, I'm feeling a temptation and then being aware of it. Okay. It's here. I, I, I sense it and giving it to God and then letting it go and moving on with my day. So that's the sequence and that, that helps me with those types of events. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I've got one more question. If there are any other questions from the um, live audience, please type those in uh, because we'll be closing this up here in a few minutes. My question here is in regards to um, game chamber, game changer number four. And I think this goes right along with the separating temptation from lust. I think that's something that leads right into it. And I'm sure you did this on purpose in this order, but <laughs> um, much like um what we hear often in in 12 step groups the recipe for recovery is simple but it is not easy mindfulness is simple but it is not easy can can you kind of explain a little bit deeper on what that means simple but not easy when it comes to mindfulness yeah um it does take practice usually things that take practice are hard if if you want to get good at bowling or ping pong, you know, that can be hard and it can be, you have to put a lot of thought and, and practice into it. Mindfulness is kind of the opposite. You have to kind of just let it settle on you. And it over months of practicing, it just settled on me where I can just take a deep breath and enjoy being present in the moment and kind of being observant of those thoughts in my head it's so simple, and but that's why starting with breathing or counting to 10, just something that's super simple can help hone that practice of, of just listening and being aware of everything. I, I, it is complicated to explain, but it, it's super simple, but it does take practice. Thank you very much. All right, so before we close up, Thomas, do you have any other words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us before we get to the closing readings and, and prayer? Yeah, I do have, I do have one. Um, the, the 12 steps, and I mentioned my game changers of recovery, the step six, the change of heart. I kind of feel like that one was a little bit too sacred for me to, to share with the public, but I do want to say that it is very real and that I feel like it's both a journey, something that happens over time, and an event. My heart was like a magnet that used to pull dirty things towards me all the time. I could be in the library and I could find that, that one book that had that one section in it in like one minute flat. My heart just pulled those things towards me. After the step six and change of heart, I felt like my heart changed so much that it was like a reverse magnet that pushed and does continue to push those things away from me. If you feel like your heart is still pulling those things towards you, that you have that draw pulling those things towards you, I invite you to study more about step six. Now, pornography is as appealing to me as a plate of squirming maggots i have no desire to look at it and i know that's possible that's what i'd like to leave with this group i love that thank you for sharing that it reminds me of a, a line from the big book we recoiled from it as if from a hot flame um yeah that change of heart is real thank you for sharing that Thanks again, Thomas. That was a great RICO 12 weekly speaker meeting for all addicts and those wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom. If you have any other questions um, that you'd like to share, whether you're here in the live audience or in the listening audience, please go to rico12.com forward slash forum and join in our community and ask those questions and answer others' questions that will come up. I invite the audience to come back next week. Um, if you have not yet gone to rico12.com and submitted your email address to get on the weekly invitation list so you can join us live each Friday at noon central time, I invite you to go do that. Uh, we are looking to fill guest speakers in March and April. 
Um, and actually, a uh, little inside baseball, my guest speaker for this next week backed out. So if you are looking to become a guest speaker and would like to do and are available on the 19th of February, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Um, just reach out to me through the website and we'll get it lined up. Now, Thomas has chosen the 12th step prayer for us to launch us out into the rest of the day with. Go ahead, Thomas, the, the, the prayer floor is yours. Thank you, Justin. The 12th step prayer. Dear God, my spiritual awakening continues to unfold. The help I have received I shall pass on and give to others, both in and out of the fellowship. For this opportunity, I am grateful. I pray most humbly to continue walking day by day on the road of spiritual progress. I pray for the inner strength and wisdom to practice the principles of this way of life in all I do and say. I need thee, my brothers, and the program every hour of every day. This is a better way to live. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Keep coming back, everybody. It works if you work it, so work it. You are worth it. like me.